Hello folks, my name is Jeff Pelly and I'm an educational consultant here at BLAST IU17 and I'm very happy to welcome you all back for the second installment of our IEP best practice series on measurable annual goals. If you were with us last time, awesome. If you weren't, you can certainly go to this link that I'm gonna highlight right here with the cursor and you can click on that link there, type that link in and you can view the presentation that was on present levels from last month we are also going to be continuing on with this best practice series and next month we will be talking about the transition section of the IEP. And as we said at the top of this one, this one is all about measure annual goals. So in addition to making sure we know about the past present level section, our next objective today is just to make sure with these measure annual goals that there are four important pieces to make sure we have in every single IEP. The condition, the student's name, clearly defined behavior, and then the performance criteria. If we can do those four things with every measure annual goal, we will be good to go and our IEPs will be not only in compliance, but also considered best practice. So just to do a quick review, the IEP stands for the Individualized Education Program. It's that document that's between the school district and the students' families that ensures that whatever we're going to um, get done in one year's time is going to be understood by both parties, again, the family and the school district. It kind of lays out the blueprint for what's going to happen again in one year's time. That contract there is used for individuals all the way through early intervention, which is age three, all the way up through age 21, when students who stay in uh, until they age out would be graduated. And it's required to be reviewed annually, but anytime a parent or a school district would like to check in on an IEP, they can always have a revision done at any time. So the IEP sections that we have, dates and demographics, special considerations, the present levels, the transition section, participation in assessments, goals and objectives, special education related services, SDIs, modifications, educational placement, and of course, Penn data reporting. And again, last time we talked about those present levels there. This time we're gonna be talking about goals and objectives. Next time, next month, we're gonna talk about those transition services there. And we will go over every section in this series with BLAST. So the present levels, what we talked about last time, basically that's the um, meat and potatoes, I like to call it, of the IEP. It's basically summarizing exactly where the student is at in that snapshot of time. And we talk about educational information there with academics. We can also talk about functional performance as well. We also have all of our related service professionals information in there also. And it provides a baseline of where we're going. The student is at this current place in time and where are we going to be going? And that's how we come up with needs that drive our measurable annual goals. Also in those present levels, if the student is age 14 or older, we do have to have a transition section. We also need to make sure that we include academic performance as we talked about, functional performance, transition section, any kind of parents concerns that the student, um, their parents might have. Uh, we also wanna know how the student's disability affects rather their involvement in the general education curriculum. We wanna know what the student does well, their strengths, and also any academic developmental and functional needs. Basically those present levels boil down to painting a picture of strengths and of needs, and we can take care of those needs through measurable annual goals or specially designed instruction. So the strengths, what does the kiddo do well? And again, those needs. The needs are based on those accurate present levels. The needs drive the measure annual goals. We have to start from a baseline. You have to have a starting point from where we were. And then in one year's time, we can forecast out where we want that individual to be in that measure annual goal. So the biggest thing that we have to remember is every single IEP, it's exactly in the title. It's an individualized education program. So it needs to be individualized. We may have statements that are cookie cutter every now and then, statements such as testing statements, uh, ESY statements, things like that. But 99% of that IP should be unique to that individual student. Just like these colored pencils are showing us here, we're all different shapes and sizes, different shades, all of that. And so should our IEPs be. So with that brief review of the IEP and the present levels out of the way, we're going to jump into those breath practices for our measurable annual goals. So the measurable annual goals are designed to meet the student's individual need resulting from their disability. We just talked a few moments ago how it's based on those individual's needs determined from the assessment information that we had in the present levels. The annual goals describe what we think that kiddo can do in one year's time. 
it's a reasonable expectation. So if that student is somebody who is just starting out reading, we're not going to say that they're going to jump six reading levels in one year time. We wanna be realistic. If it's going to be one or two reading levels, that's awesome stuff because that's realistic and that's what we think the kiddo can actually accomplish in one year's time. Those measure annual goals may also have short-term objectives. Sometimes those are those roadmaps on how we can get to that annual goal. And sometimes they teach skills that are, um, you know, differentiated from um, that point. So an example of that would be uh, if you were teaching a student, say, let's go with uh, personal maintenance. You know, if you're going to teach a student how to use the uh, toilet, how to use uh, deodorant, and how to work on their toothbrushing skills. Those can all be listed under personal maintenance, you know, but the short term objectives, you would have one for toothbrushing, one for toileting, and one for using deodorant. That's how we can do short term objectives, or we can have those skills that build on top of each other. If we want it to be at 100% accuracy by the end of the uh, goal, maybe a short term objective would be at 60%, a next short term objective might be at 80%, and then we can climb up to that 100%. You can do those short term objectives two ways. So those measure by annual goals should build on skills that we identified in the needs section. If we see a measure by annual goal that was not identified as a need earlier on in the actual present levels, that's not a good thing. We need to make sure that we have that roadmap of where the student was. It was generating a need and that need was met with a measure by annual goal. Many students have many needs. That uh, doesn't mean that we need to have 10, 15 measure annual goals. We have to prioritize those goals. Three to five for most students. Again, what we can do in one year's time. And we also wanna make sure that we're talking about a baseline and we list that baseline in the present level section. We're gonna go over that in a little bit, but that's very, very important. Make sure you have your baseline in the present levels and also in your goal statement as well. The behavior that we're talking about, what we want the student to do has to be observable. We can't use terms like improve. We want the student to improve. Well, my opinion of improve might differ from your opinion of improve. We need to actually set observable behavior there. The student is going to score X percentage rather than improve. The goals have to be monitored. You have to be able to take your data on these goals uh, during your evaluation schedule there. If you can't observe the behavior, if you can't monitor it, it's not going to be a good thing. And as we talked about, we need to make sure that we're going to include a baseline. So the measure annual goals are not curriculum. They're not uh, passing a subject. They're not going on from algebra one to algebra two. They're not averages. They're not passing a course. It's none of those things there. So when we're actually getting together to write our goals, we wanna ask ourselves, what do we want the student to actually do to show that they're learning the skill? With what materials, under what conditions, how are they going to perform that skill for us? How consistently? To get to that endpoint there, you know, we want some percentages there. We want three out of fours, um, X number of times uh, in, concession, in succession there. We need to make sure how consistent, how well they're going to do it. And then how are we going to measure it? Are we going to do teacher checklist? Are we going to do a rubric? Are we going to um, use the PSSA writing rubric? Those kind of things there. We need to make sure we're going to talk about how we're going to measure that skill. And then how often are you going to do it every day? Are you going to do it every week? Are you going to do it every other week? Once a month, those kind of things all have to be spelled out when you build your measure by annual goals. So does that uh, goal build important skills? Does the goal address prioritize needs? Uh, again, making sure those present levels where we identified a need, now we need to have that need um, taken care of with a measure by annual goal. Does the goal reflect if appropriate, if we have standards there, anchors, if that student's included in the general education curriculum, really wanna make sure we're doing some standards, some anchors there. And does that goal reflect age and individually appropriate outcomes? We need to make sure that we consider all of these things when writing our goal. The biggest takeaway here is just make sure that those goals are observable. Just like our little scientist friend here, we wanna make sure that we are always able to observe that behavior that we want the student to be doing. So these are some examples here of what is observable and what is not. If we're talking about determined, that's a big thumbs down. We can't really observe what determined is. But retell, we can have the student tell us something. We can observe that student telling us that. Sequencing things, putting it in order, improve, no way, Jose. We cannot in observe that person improving. They might improve because they scored 80% consistently, but improve is not the language that they want. We want to see that percentage point there. Matching, we can observe it. Appreciate, nope. Orally read, yep, we can observe it. Understand, nope, we can't observe that. Write, participate, we're not going to do. Label and maintain. Label is awesome. Maintain, no way. We want to make sure that we can observe it. 
All right, then we're talking about those baselines of measure annual goals. And we wanna make sure just like this awesome jazz player here that each measurable annual goal has that baseline listed in parentheses. So we're going to list that goal in the goal section and then in parentheses talk about where they're at right now. We spoke about how we're always going to have that baseline in the actual present levels, but we also wanna see it as a best practice in the goal section as well. So those goals and objectives, we wanna describe how the student's progress towards meeting that goal is going to be measured. How often are you going to measure it? Are you going to do it weekly? Are you going to do it twice a month? If we're talking about behavior, monitoring a student's behavior, that might even be daily, you know? But if we're going more than a month of, in terms of taking our data, that's not going to be enough, you know? If there is a problem with the student and they're not meeting the criteria that we want, and we're only checking in on them once every two months, there's not enough instructional time to make decisions there. So a general rule of thumb, every other week, twice a month, monthly, if you're going anything over that, that's not going to be very good. So we wanna make sure we list exactly how often we're going to measure and how we're going to do that. And how we can do that, we can talk about probes, rubrics, any kind of assessments. And the idea is if you're going to use a special assessment tool, a rubric, a checklist, an inventory, whatever, include that with the IEP. You can print that paper out, put it right in the end of the IEP there when you deliver it to the parents there. Anybody who's inheriting this student should have the tools to be able to progress monitor. So if you're using a checklist, something that you came up with, feel free to include that with the IEP as a best practice. Taking it a step further, we also wanna talk about when we're going to give that progress to the parents. And this is typically when we, we deliver those report cards, they're three times a year, four times a year, but it has to be at least those um, parts there, You know, three times a year, four times a year with a report card. You can identify that you might give reports to parents more often than that. But think about when those report cards are coming and that's typically when you're going to be sending home that report of progress. But if you identify that you're gonna report more, make sure you're doing that there, okay? We also talk about how we can put that right in with the report cards there. If there's going to be any special kind of progress reporting methods, and if you're going to document any kind of phone conversations with parents, any of that jazz, make sure that you list it. When we're taking a look at what this measure annual goal, IU17 uses the DARTS IEP writing system. So this is what the actual measure annual goal would look like. There's a statement here that says to include the condition, the name, the behavior, the criteria. So we have the measure annual goal here. And notice we have a baseline of seven for this measure annual goal. We wanna make sure that we list that. And this teacher has also listed a standard here for this emotional support goal. And these two are what we just talked about a couple of slides before, how the student's progress is going to be measured and when we're going to give that report to parents. And typically we talk about measuring it every other week. And when we're going to give that report card, uh, you know, progress there typically with report cards, either quarterly, three times a year. So we wanna also make sure that we're getting the big four components there, just like the fantastic four. I think this is the thing. Uh, one of the guys was a stretchy guy. I forget these other two here. Um, but hey, we want to make sure that we're always doing these four components for our measure annual goal. We have to have a condition. And that condition is basically the situation where you're setting up for how that behavior is going to be performed. The student's name, it sounds silly to list that as a component, but sometimes we're all guilty of the copy and paste and we might get the student's name wrong. So really ensure that you have the student's name in that goal and it's the correct name. We also wanna make sure for the third component that we have the student's behavior that's going to be in there. And again, observable, 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 very, very clear. We wanna make sure that we know what that student's going to be able to do and we can observe it. And then the last piece here in these four components, number four is the performance criteria and that's broken out three ways how well the student's going to do it, how consistent they're going to do it, and how often you are going to monitor. We're gonna go into that in a few moments. So first up, the condition. Again, that describes the situation in which the student's going to perform that behavior. We need to describe the material that will be used to evaluate the learning, and we may describe the setting for the evaluation. So some examples there are giving a reading passage, giving a picture checklist to follow, any way that you can set this up. And it could be such as simple as a related service if we're talking about speech, speech, you know, during targeted speech sessions in occupational therapy sessions, we basically have to set up when the student's going to be able to do this. For um, a student where we may be doing direct instruction, uh, it could be when giving a writing prompt, given a grade level reading passage, those type of things that we wanna make sure that we're setting up the student for the observable behavior. 
Next one, number two, we want to make sure we list the student's name. Again, this is a no brainer, but every now and then we might get guilty of the copy and paste and it doesn't come out the right way and we might have the student's name wrong. So make sure you're always double checking that and also with our pronouns there. We also want to make sure that we're getting our pronouns down there correctly. Number three talks about that clearly by defined behavior. We talked about it a few slides ago with our buddy that looked like the scientist, Mr. Albert Einstein. He was always observing things. We wanna make sure that that behavior is observable and measurable. What the student is actually going to do. And these are some examples here. Say, print, write, read, all of those things. But we don't wanna have things like understand, know, recognize, behave, improve. All of those things, they're not cut and dry. My definition of improve could be very different from your definition of improve. So we wanna make sure that it's actually observable. And the fourth criteria here, we have our performance criteria. And the fourth one is broken out in three ways. We talk about the level of performance, and that's basically the how well the student's going to do it to demonstrate mastery. The second one is the number of times. If they do it one time, that's great, but we want to make sure that it's consistent. Maybe sometimes it's three out of four times. Maybe it's uh, five out of five times, you know, for 100%. But we have to make sure we have that consistency piece in there. And the third one there is that evaluation schedule. How often is uh, the teacher going to progress monitor there? You have to make sure that you're spelling that out in the actual measure of annual goal. So these are just some graphs here and we're gonna have some supporting documents that I'm gonna talk about. So you'll be able to get these graphs, these visuals here, but this is a nice printable where you can look at how consistent and those could be percentages, accuracy, blank out of blank times, the number of times correct. If we go over here, earning a certain percentage of points, all of those things have to do with consistency. The next one here talks about mastery, okay? Three out of five random trials, five consecutive trials, four out of five trials, you know? It's one thing if the student gets it on the first try, that's great, but how consistent can they do that? Can they repeat their performance? It's always a good idea to make sure we're checking in to see how consistently we can do it. And then that evaluation schedule. How often are you as the educator going to progress monitor? For things like behavior, that's going to be daily. It's seldom used for any kind of academic piece, but behavior we're always going to be observing every single day. And some of the other ones can be up to twice a week, weekly, twice a month. We don't want to say bi-weekly anymore. The state likes us to say every other week. Bi-weekly could be twice a week. It could be twice a month. So again, avoid that term there. Try to talk about every other week or twice a month. Monthly, I'll take it. I think that's going in the right direction. But if we're going above monthly, if we're going twice uh, or once every two months, uh, quarterly, those are not going to be enough uh, check-in points there to change our instruction in case it's not working. So my recommendation here as a best practice is not to go over monthly there with your evaluation schedule. This one here is also going to be in our downloads that you're going to be able to print out there. This is a measure annual goal. Um, kind of cheat sheet here. And if you can run every single goal that you write through this cheat sheet and it works out, all of your goals will be considered a best practice and in compliance. We have our condition here. It basically sets up how we want the student to do that behavior. Then we have the student's name, that clearly defined behavior that we've been speaking about. And then our performance criteria broken out in those three ways, the how well, the how consistent, and the how often. If you print this out in the link that I'm going to give you in a few moments, and if you have that right near your desk and you refer to it every single time you write an IEP goal, you're going to be just fine and all those goals are going to be considered in compliance and again, a best practice. So we talked about the short-term objectives at the beginning of the training here. These are required for students that take the PASA and it can be for any student that you decide. But again, those students that take the PASA need to have those short-term objectives. And we have two different types of short-term objectives, the sequential ones that build upon each other and those component ones that can be taught simultaneously, but they don't have to be a sequence. So think about the sequential one getting up to that 80% and one short-term objective might be 40%, the next one might be 60% versus a component skill that might be those personal maintenance skills and we're teaching toileting, we're teaching toothbrushing and we're teaching using deodorant there. Those can be taught simultaneously. They're not dependent on each other. So as we wrap up here, we wanna make sure that we're asking ourselves, is that goal measurable? Can we actually use data collection on there? Would the student, parent or any other teacher be able to see exactly what that student's going to be able to do in one year's time. Is it clear enough? Is it written in those type of terms? How will one know if the student has accomplished that goal? What does that endpoint look like? And would somebody else come in and be able to implement that goal? And I'm sure everybody who's watching this training here today has at one point or another inherited an IEP where you had no idea how to implement 
that progress monitoring strategy for a goal because the goal was not written properly. So we always want to make sure that any other teacher that inherits these students could progress monitor that. So think about that when you're writing your goals. So when we're talking about progress monitoring, it's impossible to progress monitor goals if they're not clear and measurable. And remember, in order to write a clear and measurable annual goal, we have to have those clear present levels. They have to be in those present levels identified as a need, and then those needs are identified as measure annual goals, and then we can climb that ladder of success there. So this is just a nice graphic here of what it all looks like. We have our present level that gives us our baseline information, basically that starting point that's going to identify a need. Those needs are then developed into a measure annual goal, and that measure annual goal is progress monitored, and then it goes back to the present levels for next year. And in a practical example there, we could have a student in the present levels where we identified that they had difficulty with spelling, capitalization, grammar, punctuation, those type of things. So we identified a need saying that the student needs to improve their written language by using a consistent strategy for proofreading and self-correcting of errors. So that need basically turned into this measure annual goal. Given a consistent use of a strategy and it's the scope strategy and spelling check of his choice, Marcus will review and write his reading I'm sorry, we'll write and review his writing to include 80% correct spelling, punctuation, capitalization, and grammar on five out of six randomly selected short-term writing assignments. And then we have the baseline in there at 60%. Can we observe our friend Marcus getting 80% correct with spelling, punctuation, capitalization, and grammar? Of course we can. Those are all observable things that we're going to be able to do. And we can observe that criteria of 80%. And we can observe that criteria of five out of six randomly selected short writing assignments. And then that progress monitoring, we're going to do it twice a month using a checklist there. And that progress monitoring is then going to be reported in next year's present levels. So we talked about supporting documents a few slides ago. And this URL right here, shortur at forward slash F, capital A, capital L, capital Z, two. If you type that all in, you're going to be able to download two fantastic supporting documents for our Measure Annual Goal Best Practice series here. The first one is a worksheet where we had some of those graphics earlier, where we can run our Measure Annual Goal through that nice full color document there. There's also some performance criteria, uh, full color documents there. So that's all in our development Measure Annual Goals PDF. And then we also have a Measure Annual Goal writing checklist there for you to be able to print out at your leisure. And when we're wrapping it all up, and remember, I always like to eat my burritos at Chipotle, so that's why we have that there. So we're talking about wrapping each measure annual goal up. We need to make sure we have that observable behavior. If we can't observe it, there's no way we're going to be able to take data on it. And remember to wrap it up with these four components. Remember those fantastic four folks there. We have to have a condition, the student's name, clearly defined behavior, and that performance criteria. I want to thank you all for hanging in there and getting through this brief IEP best practice series on measure annual goals with me. Again, this was Jeff Pelly from the IU. My contact information is jpelly at iu17.org, or you can give me a phone call at 570-323-8561 on that extension 1007. I'm really looking forward to seeing you next time, and thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We'll see you next time.